the sermon this morning. Um, as you remember, last time we did for me to live as Christ and to die in vain. Um, this time as we were talking, um, we thought the subject of <coughs> God's sovereignty versus man's <coughs> responsibility would be good. And I'm sure most of you know, I think most of you know Pastor Michael. Um, it's our pleasure this morning to welcome him into the pulpit. Uh, yes, I'm going to switch. I'm used to all this electronic gadgetry. See if this works. Oh yeah, that works. All right. Uh, thank you. I want to thank on behalf of uh, Reform Fellowship Church uh, and its members. I want to thank you all for your hospitality and for the lovely breakfast that we shared with you this morning. And it is an honor and pleasure to be here to not only worship with you but to share the Word of God. Uh, before we do that, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, Mighty One, Holy God. We honor you, we adore you, we love you, we exalt you, and we do so here on this earth in incompleteness. We long to be able to do all those things perfectly, and one day when we see you face to face, we will be able to do that perfectly, to be able to worship you and praise you, to exalt you and love you perfectly. What a glorious day that will be. We thank you. For your glorious word that is unchanging, that never fails. It is inerrant and all-sufficient. And that is because it comes from you. You who are inerrant and all-sufficient and never changing. Thank you for your glorious word and your beloved son who is our savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Today, as Dan talked about, we'll look at God's sovereignty and mankind's responsibility. And God's sovereignty is one of the core truths in Christianity. You must know that God is sovereign. And you must know what that means. Because it will help you to put God in his proper place. Which in turn will help put you in your proper place. What does it mean that God is sovereign? Well, what does sovereign mean? What does sovereignty mean? To be sovereign is to be all-powerful, to have all power and all authority, to have no other position above you, to not be able to be outranked. God is the supreme power and authority. He is preeminent. He is above all. He is the sovereign of sovereigns. That's who God is. The buck stops with him. He's in control of everything. The ultimate ruler. Not a single atom can move or deviate from his will. If it could, if anything could, then he would not be a very sovereign God. He wouldn't be God. God is God. There's no one higher. Everything must answer to him. There must be no exceptions. If there were exceptions, that would be contrary to what the Word of God says about himself. We see in Psalm 103, verse 19, that the Lord has established his thrones in the heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. If you're feeling a little puffed up today, let me remind you of, that you are just dust by quoting Daniel 4.35, which says, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does, God does, according to his will, among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Psalm 115, verse 3 says, our God is in the heavens and he does all that we let him do. No, all that he pleases. Let me assure you, that is a very small snippet of what God's Word says about His sovereignty. He rules over all. He is supreme. He is far above us, and His will is far above our own puny will. And so it's not my will or your will that will always be done. 
It is God's will that will always be done. Nothing happens without his doing or with his allowing. Everything must answer to him. In Isaiah 46, we see a little glimpse of God's sovereignty. God says, I am God and there is no other. There's no other God. I am God and there is none like me. He's claiming that he's unique in the universe. He's in a class all by himself. No one is like him because he and he alone is sovereign. God says what it means to be the one and only God. In Isaiah 46, verse 8, starting in verse 8, it says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. We are all transgressors against God because we have all sinned against God. So God's talking to all of us here. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, and the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. Verse 10 there says what it means to be God and to be sovereign. I declare the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet come. That's ordaining. That's God being God. He declares how things are going to turn out long before they're going to happen. Not just natural events, but human events. All things not yet done. And he says in the latter part of verse 10 that I will accomplish all my purposes. God's the one who ensures his own word. He doesn't rely on me or you. He is perfectly sovereign and powerful enough to do his own will and make sure that his own will comes to fruition i will accomplish all my purpose he says he doesn't just know the future this isn't talking about a god who looks into a giant crystal ball and says oh i see a thousand years from now that this is what michael will do and i approve of what michael will do so therefore i will go back in time and allow this to happen no he is not a reactionary god he plans the future and he accomplishes it that's what a sovereign god does he plans the future, and he makes sure to accomplish it, including salvation. The future is the counsel or will of God being established. The future is also the will of God being accomplished by God. Then in the next verse, verse 11, in the second half, he gives a clear indication of what he means. He says, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Do you hear a lot of eyes? It's God talking about himself doing it. He's not saying, I'll make a way and then I'm, it's up to you. I'll, make, I'll do a little bit of the work, but you have to do the, None of that is here. It is God unabashedly being God. In other words, the reason God's predictions come true is because they are his purposes and because he himself performs them to make sure that they are done. That's why there's such assurance, including in your salvation. There's no room for doubt when God's the one who does it all. He doesn't react, he ordains. He doesn't need a crystal ball. He knows what's coming because he planned what's coming. And he performs what he plans to make sure all is done according to his will. This is the sovereignty of God, that God has the right, the authority, the freedom, the wisdom, and the power to bring about everything that he intends to happen, everything. And therefore, everything he wills to come about does come about because he ordains it and he accomplishes it. I want to quickly talk about just some of the extent of God's sovereignty to try and paint a, a pure picture. God is sovereign over nature. What appears to be random acts in the world, God is sovereign over that. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but his every decision is from the Lord. There's not any event so small that God does not rule, for his purposes are not two sparrows sold for a penny. Jesus said, Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. 
He's in the business of every single thing down to the smallest molecule. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered according to Matthew 10. From ants and worms in the ground to the stars in the galaxy, God rules the entire world, the entire universe. In the book of Jonah, God commands a fish to eat to uh, swallow Jonah. God then commands a plant to grow, and he also commands a worm to kill the plant that he commanded to grow. All God, all God. And far above the worm, stars take their place and hold it there to God's command. We know that thanks to Isaiah 40, which says, Lift your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatest of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. How much more than the natural events of this world, weather, disasters, disease, disability, death, God is sovereign over all these things. Psalm 147 says, He sends out His command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters hoarfrost like ashes. He hurls down His crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before His cold? He sends out His word and melts them. He makes His wind blow and the waters flow. Do you get the point? God is sovereign over nature. There's nothing He's not sovereign over. Whether for judgment or for grace, God causes all things to happen according to his will. Causes, makes, happens, or allows. God can simply speak, peace, be still, and winds will cease, and there will be great calm, like we see in Mark 4. Which means if the winds blow, God intended them to blow. And we can trust him. No matter what's happening, whether the winds are ceased or whether the winds blow. Amos 3, verse 6 says, Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? It's talking about God's active and passive will. That all things are done. God must either actively or passively allow everything. Right? That's his, that's his power. That's his right. He sits above all. So everything that happens is either done by his active will, him doing it himself and making it come to pass, or he's allowing it to fulfill his will. And that's where real trust and faith in him comes in, doesn't it? When good things happen, it's easy to say, God's great, he's so good, he's amazing. But when bad things happen, you should still have the same amount of trust and faith in an all-sovereign God, trusting in his will above your own. Even when we suffer, Peter said to the suffering saints in Asia Minor in 1 Peter 4, verse 19, the Lord says to Moses, who has made a man's mouth? Oh, excuse me. Uh, Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Even while we suffer, we trust. Not saying, oh no, God's off the throne, the plan's gone off the rails because I'm suffering. No, suffering's part of the plan. It's part of the plan. Christ even suffered. Are you above your Lord that you should not be called to suffer when Christ himself, the one who made the very tree that he hung upon, suffered for your sake? You're too good to suffer for his? Whether we suffer from disability or the evil of others, God is the one who ultimately decides. Deuteronomy 32 says, There's no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. This makes people uncomfortable. But this is God in his own words. I kill and I make people alive. I wound and I heal. Heal. There is no one that can deliver out of my hand. We must, like Job, say, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's trust. The, the fall of a sparrow, the crawl of a worm, the movement of the stars, blowing wind, falling snow, the loss of sight, the suffering of his saints, the death of his saints, all are included in the words of God when he says in Isaiah 46, I will accomplish my purposes. God's sovereign in our human actions as well. When we turn from the natural world to the world of our human actions and interactions, God's sovereignty is just as extensive. It has not changed. It's not one way for the natural world and something else for our interactions with one another. For instance, if you vote, you as a mere human being will not be the one who causes the decisive uh, choice for victory or loss. That is in the hands of God alone. 
He says in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 4 that God alone will have the supreme rule. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He removes presidents and sets up presidents. The Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So whoever the next president is, they will not be sovereign. God is sovereign. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord is what stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generations. Psalm 33. When we think of some other examples, we think of when the world or nations did their absolute worst, when they murdered Christ, God's own son. Even then, even when that happened, things were not out of the sovereign God's control. Even that, even in them disobeying God and killing his son, even in doing that, those people were doing the sweet bidding of God and his sovereign world and plan. God is sovereign. It says in Acts 4, Truly in this city where they were gathered against your holy servant Jesus, those whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand, whatever God's hand, whatever your plan, whatever God's plan, had predestined to take place. God put Herod there. God put Pontius Pilate there. God put Christ there. They were all in their proper place. Nothing was out of line. This wasn't, Christ didn't die because God's plan went awry. That was his plan all along. So even the worst sin that happened in all of history was allowed by God, was used by God. That sin was allowed to happen so that all sin would die through Christ's substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. It's like what Joseph said to his brothers. You meant evil for me, but God used it for good. God can take what is evil and use it for the accomplishment of his good plan. And so our salvation is secured on Calvary under the sovereign hand of God. We're saved by God, from God, for God. Every one of us that he calls to believe. And if you are a believer in Jesus, if you love him, you are a walking, talking miracle. And that miracle of being a believer is all thanks to the sovereign God. His work, not yours. This is how much credit you get. He gets it all. All the glory. Even faith is God's gracious gift to his elect. God granted you repentance. A sovereign God granted it to you. 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 through 25 says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. This is, a good, this is good for those of you who deal with others who oppose you. Right? If you're a believer and you've got people who oppose you, listen to this as well. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with wrath, no gentleness. God, why? That God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Not only is that telling you how you should behave as believers, but it's also telling you that this nugget, God may have perhaps grant them repentance. How has repentance happened? Because you get it in your head and you're so smart one day, or you just, you're so smart and so strong that you were able to figure it out. No, God must grant it. That's sovereignty. He must grant it which will lead to knowledge and truth. God's the one who reveals himself to those that he calls. Matthew 11, verse 27 says, All things, this is Jesus speaking, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That's God's sovereignty again. God gave you the gift of faith. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Your salvation has nothing to do with your works. It has to do with Christ's work. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. Grace is unmerited favor. It means it's unearned. You can't earn grace. It has to be given to you as a free gift by God. A sovereign God who gives it to whom he will. When Peter writes that the chosen are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in 1 Peter 1, he's not using the the word foreknowledge to mean that God was aware beforehand who would believe and then therefore chooses them. In other words, God doesn't look forward in the future and say, ah, 
Michael's going to believe, therefore I shall preordain him to be saved and be chosen. That's not what's happening. Rather, Peter means that God determines before time who he's going to save. He chose them without any regard to anything good or bad that we would do. It's just by his sovereign will that he chose. Therefore, you have nothing to boast about ever. No one ever in the whole history of heaven will be able to stand before the Lord or stand before another believer there and say, you know, God was really good and all, but did you see that 1% of good works I did that helped him to make me get saved? Nobody can say that. It's all God's sovereign power. And that's something that our sinful nature doesn't like. Human pride is uncomfortable with the suggestion that God ordains everything. He controls everything. He rules over everything. Our sinful nature, uh, we don't like that. We don't like that, especially here in America, right? Freedom. I get to choose. I'm in charge. Most of all, the notion that salvation is entirely God's work makes people uncomfortable. However, this is exactly what the Holy Scriptures tell us. Jonah 2 verse 9 says salvation is of the Lord. He gives it. He gives it. In Romans 3, we read how no one seeks after God. If no one seeks after God, then it means God must be the one who does a work in someone to make them want to seek after him. Right? Because otherwise, no one's seeking for him. Because no one is good. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In the New Testament, we learn that all believers are chosen of God in Titus 1. In Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 5, he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. That's a sovereign God. Before anything ever happened, before the world was even created, God chose whose names he would put in the Lamb's book of life. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ according to the intention of his will. We're called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28 and 30, we're called according to his purposes for whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That means to be glorified one day. And those whom he predestined, he calls. And those whom he calls, he justifies. And those whom he justifies, he also glorifies. That is a formula, people. If God calls you, he is going to justify you. And if he justifies and saves you, he is going to glorify you. There isn't any asterisk there, no small print. It is guaranteed because God's the one who does it. He ordains it and he brings it about and causes it to happen and be completed. I conclude, therefore, with the words of Paul in Ephesians 1.11. We were predestined according to God's purpose, who works all things after the counsel of our will. All things. Wind, rain, stars, everything is under his command and done and allowed by him to accomplish his holy and perfect will, including the gift of grace, faith, repentance, and salvation. So if our sovereign God does it all, if he's sovereign, what responsibility do I have? It's a good question. Let's leave that for Dan. He gets to answer that. If I were to have a coin in my hand this morning, I would use it as an example because now we are flipping it over. Michael handled heads. It's up to me to handle tails. The problem with us as people is we think that we need to have complete explanation for everything. And that everything needs to fall into place in a logical type of order. And for most things in life, it does. I have never come to a, a place where one plus one has never equaled two. That makes sense. But after Michael getting done today, I'm, I'm kind of scared to even walk around because I don't want to get tangled up in the little strings that are over my head that lead up to God. As some might conclude that I am a marionette and God is the puppeteer. Let me lead us this morning to John chapter 3. If you would open up there for me.
John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Jesus is having his great discourse with Nicodemus. And in this discourse, he tells Nicodemus, when Nicodemus says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looks at him and says, nothing. He says, you must be born again. And that whole sense of being born, we can liken to our own physical births. Let me see the hands of the people in this room who had anything to do with your physical birth. And you would say, well, Dan, that's silly. I wasn't even here. And that's what Jesus was talking and telling Nicodemus. In order to know me, you must be born again. Well, then we look at verses 11 through 21. Same chapter. Same conversation. Verses 1 through 10. Everything is of God. Follow me as I read verses 11 through 21. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. Jesus says, You must be born again. You can't do anything. And he says, you heard it, and you reject it. Verse 12. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. In verses 1 through 10, the term born again is repeated five times. And again, what can we do in order to be born? Nothing. In verses 11 through 21, there's a word that's repeated seven times. And this is where man's responsibility comes in. Because over and over and over again, Jesus uses the word believe. Now the purpose of our interaction this morning is not to get you to be able to walk out this morning and understand how two complete opposite ideas can coexist. I don't understand it. These are truths that run parallel to each other. God is sovereign in everything, and man is responsible for his own doing. I don't understand. And I dare say there's 
No one born of this earth outside of the Lord Jesus Christ himself who does have the proper understanding. We try to understand. There's denominations within Christianity that hold up to both sides. I have a man I know, brother-in-law to a friend of mine who is part of the apostolic church. They fight as hard towards the side of man's responsibility as anybody I've ever seen in the Reformed camp fight for the doctrines of grace. For you see, it's almost easy to understand one or the other. But when we try to put those together, it's like putting a square, square peg in a round hole. So how can the two coexist? How can God be completely sovereign, yet man completely responsible? Because the Bible teaches that. You cannot remove either truth from the pages of Scripture. We cannot make God any less God to suit our own whims and our own pleasures. You see, if God were to, in his sovereignty, choose to remove himself from a situation and give us the power to do it, then he would cease to be God. Because the whole concept of a sovereign God, as Michael said, is to be totally in control of everything. These truths run parallel. Real quickly, Isaiah chapter 10. As God is dealing with the people of Israel, as God is setting up the Assyrians to come against Israel, verse 5, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. God sets the nation of Assyria against Israel to be his tool, to be his arrow in his, bolt, his bow to rain judgment down on Israel. Look at verse 7. Talking about Assyria. Yet it does not intend, yet it does, it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. It wasn't a serious plan to go against Israel. It was God's plan to set Assyria against Israel. And even though God uses Assyria in this way, has Assyria do his bidding? Verse 5 again, woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hands 
is my indignation. How can God take Assyria, put it in this position of doing his bidding, and then turn around and punish them for doing the same thing? We might want to say that is a contradiction, but the Bible does not contradiction to contradict. Turn real quickly to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son reveals to him. Could that be any more clear? The only one who knows the Son is the one to whom the Son wills to reveal himself. You can't know Christ if he doesn't will it for you to believe in him. If he doesn't will it, you don't know him. But verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God's sovereignty, no one comes to the Father, yet I will it. Man's responsibility, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I could go on and on and on and show us over and over again how these two truths are interwoven throughout Scripture. Like two train tracks both heading in the same direction, both carrying the same train, yet never crisscrossing. I can't understand the mind of God. The Bible is clear on that. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts greater than our thoughts. And it seems like when I do try to understand his ways, that I lose track of my responsibility. And if I dwell too much on my responsibilities, then I lose track of his ways. What is man's responsibility? When it comes to salvation, it is to believe. Our responsibility in salvation is to believe. Then what is our responsibility because of our salvation? Notice the change of wording. Our responsibility because of of our salvation is to preach the gospel. See, Paul was probably the closest in being able to understand how these two mixed and related. Definitely as well as any human being ever could. Because he said, Oh, the dip, depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. The first thing we need to acknowledge is this. What God knows and what God understands is vastly beyond us. It's at a depth that we cannot fathom. 
In fact, Paul says how, search, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. Well, how do we respond to these two truths? Do we just give up? God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. Right down to the day of man's death, is appointed by God. I've been guilty at times when my dear wife will look at me eat like I ate this morning. And she will say, you're forgetting you're a diabetic. And I will throw out, there's a day appointed unto me to die. And I can't bring that on any quicker. What a cop out. What a falsehood. We have a mandate. We as believers who know the truth of God. See, the, the sovereignty of God in our life Knowing everything we can know about his, how sovereign he is, how in control he is, should give us peace. It should give us comfort. It should bring us to humility. Too often I've seen where this truth has brought people to arrogance, brought people to a entitlement mentality. How glad I am that God is saved. How lucky God is that he found me to save. No. How blessed I am that out of all the people on this earth, God loved me. And because of that, it is my job, my responsibility to proclaim his love to a dying world. Paul said, how will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? How will they believe in him whom they haven't heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are saved? Don't get locked up in the misnomer that you can't be saved because God hasn't called you. We don't know who God has called and who he has not. Our responsibility is to believe. Jesus said, all who believe on him, he will in no way That's how they go together. Not that we understand it. Not that we come to an understanding that one, one plus one equals two. Because in this case, it doesn't. Not in our minds, anyways. God is using a type of math that we just don't understand. But we have the promise from him that he is sovereign. And we can come to him through repentance and faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time that we could gather. Lord, as we discuss two truths that seem to oppose one another, that don't mix like oil and water, it almost seems. But in the great plan of God, They come together like banana cream pie. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you are in complete control. Father, I can't understand. I, I don't understand how time does not affect you. 
that you created time and you are above time. I cannot understand that. I cannot understand how the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three, yet one. It blows my mind. How can that be? But it is. Lord, I can't understand or begin to understand how you from the foundation of the world before time began chose for you a people unto, them, unto yourself. Yet, Lord, people are still responsible for their relationship with you. Father, I thank you for the truths of your word. I thank you that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. If you're here today and you say, well, God has not called me unto salvation, you are using your responsibility to reject what God has planned. If we know enough to reject, we know enough to hate God. And that's what it is. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his life so you could be reconciled. Will you call upon him this morning if you have not? Those of us here this morning who know him, we've, we've bent our knee to him. We've repented. We've turned our ways. May we take the truths of what we've just learned, apply them, and go out into all the world the gospel.